Welcome to Cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We are incredibly excited for today's interview because the gentleman that I'm about to introduce to you has been called the next Satoshi, and he may in fact prove that to be correct within the world of blockchain technology. Our guest today is Mr. Paul Snow. Paul is the founder and CEO of Factum, which is a blockchain innovations company. He is one of the founders of the Texas Bitcoin Conference, and he invested in Bitcoin when it was selling at just 70 cents. This is a man with an instinct for the future of technology and who is, by profession, a brilliant programmer. This combination has led to his creation of his company called Factum, and we are thrilled to have him here today. Paul, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great, and I'm really, really happy to be on your show. Oh, we are thrilled to have you here. We want to start off by talking about something that we are watching happen in society. Paul, in a recent poll, almost all retirees said that they did not know anything about Bitcoin. This is a huge portion of the population. And this is also a lot of money. Pension fund managers manage about 75 million baby boomers in the United States alone. What needs to occur in terms of educating the public to create a simpler user experience for retirees and for everybody else to step into owning digital assets? Well, I, I, I think that there are a number of things that need to occur. We need the right infrastructure. The infrastructure will allow people to direct that some of their 401ks, some of their uh, IRAs, um, their Roth IRAs uh, can be held in uh, cryptocurrency, um, uh, particularly the Roth IRAs. If Roth IRAs had been available uh, to um, invest in cryptocurrency uh, back when I first uh, got some Bitcoin at 75 cents, unfortunately, I just didn't get enough. Um, if, if that had been available, I would have paid almost nothing in taxes and I would have millions of dollars uh, available to me in my retirement. And as you know, you're only taxed on what you put into a Roth IRA. That would have just been brilliant for cryptocurrency. Tim Draper uh, is estimating that Bitcoin will go up to $250,000 a coin. Right now it's about $5,000 a coin. These kinds of predictions are not as crazy as they seem. Uh, there was a time back when I bought it for, you know, under a dollar, Bitcoin under a dollar, that people absolutely dismissed the idea that it could be $1,000. And once it attained $1,000 in 2013, and we saw the crypto winner of 2015 and part of 2016, it was asserted we'd never get up to 1000 again and we saw Bitcoin rise to $20,000. Um, yes, it's come down again to a little over $5,000, but the, the point is that in the design of Bitcoin that there is a very limited supply, which means that investments in Bitcoin, like investments in gold, are an investment in a auditable, trackable resources of a resource of limited supply, which makes it an incredibly great way to keep score on the investment uh, into the future, which is what's driving the value up. The limited supply, global interest. And I was talking to a representative in the state of Texas on this very particular point. Um, I'm not going to name him because I, I don't know that I have permission from him to, 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 to tell you who <laughs> is thinking of this. <laughs> but he's, he is looking at uh, allowing the uh, states to invest in cryptocurrency in their pension plans because he's looking at this massive growth of wealth that's occurred by everyone that has invested in Bitcoin through the years. And he's saying, why don't we have some exposure to our pensions in uh, Texas or pensions in other states? Um, it, it's an idea that makes a whole lot of sense in the first movers 
into this space are going to reap a lot of rewards. And unlike, you know, a lot of times they go, you know, tulips, tulips, you know, you're just investing in things and they have no value. But unlike tulips, you can't just plant them and grow as many as you want. And this is the problem with a, a lot of our assets like dollars and euros that the central banks can print as much as they like and you can invest in stocks, but they can dilute you with new stock issuance and, and create new uh, equity. So uh, all of these other opportunities or options for creating value and pensions, they pale to the idea of a managed limited asset that has uh, nearly uh, unlimited potential for defining wealth. And so I, 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 when you ask me what needs to happen, we need to have more regulatory um, acceptance of funds that, that invest in crypto. You need to have regulatory permission to liquidate those assets under some reasonable way of defining a capital asset and taxing uh, the, the liquidation of a capital asset. With that and with um, some adoption by uh, big companies, pension plans, and, and uh, maybe even state governments and federal government, uh, crypto could just massively uh, uh, take over a lot of how we define value. Exactly. Now, Paul, what do you attribute the recent 65% surge in the price of Bitcoin from 3200 to where it stands right now, about $5,300? Well, I, I, Bitcoin is a limited asset, and there are innumerable numbers of people who, while they're not necessarily entering the market, they know the market's going to go up. And so when there's some indication the market is recovering, then the, that money comes back in. And when that money comes back in, it drives the price up. So uh, not only is Bitcoin um, uh, pushing up in price, if you look at the volume of Bitcoin being exchanged, it's remarkably high compared to, um, let's say, Microsoft stock or, or, or any other asset that's traded. Um, it, it is traded on any number of exchanges because it has a immutable ledger that all parties uh, can look at for settlement. So it's the most easily settled, most available, uh, available for trading worldwide. It, is, it has no barriers to entry, uh, whether you're in the developing world or you're in the uh, Western world. Um, it, as an asset, it is the one world asset that the world can invest in. So I'm not surprised it's gone up 65%. I'm surprised it hasn't gone up by two or three X. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in Bitcoin. Exactly. <laughs> We're all surprised it hasn't <laughs> shot up. <laughs> What's the 65%? We need 40,000%. Now, Paul, <laughs> who do not pay attention to the underlying technology of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, they perceive it to be sort of a stagnant digital coin with a fluctuating price. But it's actually a very dynamic, vibrant, living technology. What have been some of the recent and biggest developments within the Lightning Network that you've seen and other ancillary products that have come along in the past year or so? Well, I mean, you mentioned the Lightning Network. Um, that's massive and huge, as well as um, a, a number of movements to effectively, you know, there's two terms for mine. When you're in cryptocurrency, you think of mining as a uh, uh, validating and verifying transactions, packaging them, and being paid uh, for that process. But there's another sort of mining that's kind of more traditional, like in digging up an app, a, a valuable resource so that you can apply it to some other problem. You can dig up gold and make jewelry. You can dig up uh, iron and make uh, skyscrapers, right? Well, Bitcoin allows you to mine its security, 
with just a single hash written into the Bitcoin blockchain, you can effectively digitally secure and prove the data integrity of nearly unlimited uh, data assets. So Bitcoin um, has the potential for creating a ongoing data integrity layer that uh, can be applied to business processes in innumerable ways. Um, uh, Bitcoin is often criticized for the amount of energy that it's, that, that it's used to secure the blockchain. But the, the uh, detractors fail to recognize that Bitcoin is its entire ecosystem. Every time they compare it to Visa, you should say, well, what about the banking industry? Because without the banking industry, Visa is nothing. Bitcoin is everything within the crypto world. Visa is just a slim lightning network for the financial network. Um, if I look at the cost, elect, uh, the electricity cost of the lightning network, it's nothing compared to Visa. In fact, you burn less electricity running the lightning network than Visa burns doing point of sale in, in innumerable merchant uh, locations, like maybe a thousand times more power than it's required to run the Lightning Network. And the Lightning Network can allow, can enable us to, to buy coffee, it can allow us to uh, pay each other for lunch, uh, it allows a lot, of, it has an enormous potential. It also has enormous problems. Um, because there is the need to get a firm routing system for the Lightning Network so I can seamlessly and easily pay anyone and have the routing work. There's also regulatory issues. There are some concern that um, by multiple parties participating in the Lightning Network to move value, that the government might come and, and say that the intermediate intermediate parties or money transmitters. They never have custodial control of the funds. And we need the government to say that regulation, uh, that, that money service business and money transfer businesses, uh, do, laws and regulations do not apply if parties have no custodial control of funds. So, so we really need um, <laughs> A lot of people would say we really need good regulation. What we need is regulation to go away where cryptography solves the problem. And Bitcoin is solving problems every single day with cryptography that we use armies and regulators to solve in the banking and financial network. And, uh, and you know, I have a riff on that and I, I'd be happy to share that with you. But the the, the enormous potential of Bitcoin to not just serve as a store of value, but to serve as the basis of a payment rail, to serve as the basis of a uh, identity, digital, strong, sovereign digital identity rail, and to serve as a uh, platform for the data integrity of business processes and government processes so that there's honesty, not just in Bitcoin, but in all of the economy. And that is going to create such a, a, a payback in efficiency and fairness that it just will blow your mind when you really dig into it. You know, that brings me now to your company, Fact. Mm -hmm. And first, we'd love to hear your riff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my riff, is, my riff is always North Korea. North Korea was accused in 2018 of mining $200 million worth of Bitcoin, as much as that much. And, and this is a bad thing because we don't like North Korea and they're making money mining Bitcoin. Okay, so that's bad. What's ignored is they're following the rules. They're actually mining Bitcoin legitimately. But the only thing that's backing the rules is cryptography. Uh, a, a number of programmers, you know, the smelly scientists in the back of the room that have no armies, no treaties, no international agreements, no connections with financial networks in Europe and the U.S., no banks, no, no anything. They just wrote code, and that's enough to make North Korea follow the rules and play 
alongside China, the US, Germany, Estonia, everyone follows the rules. And there's not one person tasked with enforcing them there, as a policeman. There's not one army. There, there's no sanctions that will be applied to North Korea if they break Bitcoin. Nothing, just math. In 2017, about the same time, we learned that North Korea is counterfeiting the new $100 bill that the U.S. spent $3 billion creating so that North Korea couldn't counterfeit the $100 bill. But they're counterfeiting it now. All the armies, all the financial institutions, threats of sanctions, all those things apply to stopping North Korea from counterfeiting $100 bills, and yet they are, okay? And those $100 bills go out into the economy, and they can't be distinguished from legitimate $100 bills. Therefore, suddenly commerce is using them, and now someone six transactions away may, be, may find that their money is no good because someone does finally recognize that they're counterfeit. That, that kind of systemic risk in normal financial processes exists because of asymmetry. It takes almost nothing to print a bad $100 bill, but it takes an enormous amount of effort for parties to try to figure out that it is in fact counterfeit. With Bitcoin, it takes them a huge amount of effort to create a block of transactions, but every single node in the Bitcoin network can tell trivially that, that a bad block is bad and throw it away. So hard to create, easy to throw away, no fraud. Easy to create, hard to throw away, fraud all over the place. <laughs> Corruption. <laughs> so this is where the blockchain changes the thing. We can begin to create business processes that from a cryptography point of view is absolutely solid and every consumer of that data can trivially throw it, trivially throw it away if it's bad. This means that Bitcoin has not just shown how to send money, they've shown us how to create supply chains where you can trust the origin of your food and your drugs. They've created a mechanism for settlement between parties that settles quickly and honestly, and both parties know where they stand all the way through every step of the business process. And guess what? When every party in a business process can validate that the previous guy has done his job correctly before they invest the effort to move that business process forward, guess what you don't need? Regulators, laws, and, and, and all this costly uh, interference with business processes. Brilliant. Now, Paul, shifting gears just a little bit, in your opinion, how should investors be viewing altcoins? Are these essentially startup companies that trade on coin exchanges instead of stock markets and they're just less regulated? In other words, should investors examine them in the same way that they conduct research on startup tech stocks? Absolutely. One of the things that tokenization has done is it's opened the world to the common man to invest in a lot of very early stage uh, companies. And, and what um, regulation has generally done is required uh, investors to be an accredited investor in order to invest in certain uh, startups. And what this, is, what this has done is ensure that even very, very knowledgeable people, even very, very responsible people who just don't happen to have a lot of money are not allowed to invest in some of the most promising and, and uh, rewarding opportunities. It has, a, it has a side effect of perpetuating a concentration of wealth because only the really wealthy can pick up these real, uh, invest in these real gems when, they're, when the investment is very, very low. Um, uh, unlike Bitcoin, when I 
bought Bitcoin f- at 70, 75 cents uh, back in 2011, uh, anybody could have done that. Um, and, and when in 2017, when a bunch of people issued tokens, anybody could buy those tokens. Um, I, I do think there is a massive need to do research before you invest in anything. Uh, and that's just anything. Uh, I do think that we have to be particularly careful with uh, people that issue tokens because they can issue tokens for pennies. And uh, that without that level of effort coming into the system um, and with the fact that it's very, very hard to figure out whether this is a good investment or not, the, this is a very, very risky combination. Very little effort to generate tokens, a lot of difficulty to tell whether you should buy them. This is the, this is the recipe for fraud. So what you really want to do is look at who is involved, what is their track record, what is their problem? Is it, are they really solving a problem? Or is it like the internet where they say, I have a website, invest in me. You know, that, that was the 90s and the 2000s and, and literally billions and billions of dollars went into companies that had nothing except a website. Well, today, or, or in 2017 in particular, a lot of millions and millions of dollars went into companies that just had a token. They, they didn't have a real story. So. Caution, caution, caution. <laughs> caution, caution, caution. We want to mention right now, you have a coin. Factum. Yes, we do. Fact, fact, Factum has a coin. The, the token represents the ability to use the software. And the token, uh, and so that by, in, in that regard, we called it a software sale back in 2014. We distributed a token, uh, about eight, uh, 8. 8.7 million tokens at that time. Um, it, the, there has been no token issuance until uh, somewhere around uh, the summer of uh, 2018 when we became fully distributed and autonomous. Right now, the protocol is run by 25 parties worldwide. It's growing to, towards 65 parties that will be running the protocol. And once it was distributed and autonomous and out of our hands with a governance, uh, protocol governance that is not under our control, then the rewards began to pay the people to run the protocol. Now, Paul, what are your thoughts on how cryptocurrencies will fit into the future? Where do you see them affecting everybody for everyday transactions? I think that crypto uh, tokens and crypto um, uh, payment systems like Lightning present a massive, massive advance over credit cards and other systems that we have been using because those systems are just so prone to fraud and and abuse. Um, There's a massive it, uh, constant level of, of fraud inside of uh, credit cards because anyone, every time you hand your card to a wait, waiter in the U.S. and they walk away from you, uh, they, they can create, you know, capture enough data to go online and, and, and be you. So, <laughs> so, uh, so that's a real problem. Um, even in Europe, there's the potential for fraud uh, with banking and financial systems. The crypto systems are going to add that security layer through lightning, through uh, on-chain transactions, through um, uh, even something that looks more like traditional payment rails but has a uh, uh, data integrity layer that ensures that the, the actual data transacted can't be messed with. Um, can't be changed. Security has two two problems. One problem is secrets, but the bigger problem is don't change my data. And today, we we the only way we can keep people from changing data data is to put the same walls around secrets that we put around the data itself. And what we need to 
do with crypto is we can take all the data integrity problems, put the hashes on the blockchain. Now, none of the data can get changed without you detecting that it's been modified and the correct data can be restored. So this makes sure, this means that we can reduce the security problem from this big thing to just securing our secrets. And that's a massive improvement. And that's going to hit you uh, at the point of sale. It's going to hit you when you buy a house. It's going to make your life better when you eat food in a restaurant because you know where the food came from. You're, you're going to be, uh, it's going to be safer to take medication. It's going to be safer to go have an operation because your medical history will be available cryptographically, provably available to the doctor to make the right decisions. Um, it, it just is going to revolutionize everything. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it's just like that automatic window, you know, where you just push a button to bring the window up. I, I grew up rolling the window up and down, right? Uh, it's, these, it, it's just going to make life work. And, and, and that is uh, it's going to make everyone's life better. It's going to feel like we're coming out of the age of the dinosaurs, isn't it? It really is. And you know what's really funny when I watch sci-fi? is I go, oh, you know, because when they're paying in to uh, dollars or something or somebody has it, I'm thinking, well, they don't realize by the time we get to space, it's going to be crypto based. It's not going to be, we're not going to be messing around with old financial systems and, 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 and it's going to look entirely different and it's going to be so much more safe, private and convenient for, uh, for us uh, as just regular people. What are some of the current laws regarding taxation of crypto assets? A lot of the laws for uh, taxing and managing crypto are massively draconian and and they are very crypto technology and blockchain technology uh, agnostic um, yeah, keep in mind that in Massachusetts when they introduced cars uh, there was a law in the books that when you saw someone riding a horse up on the horizon who had to stop your car pull out a Roman candle and fire it into the air. If the man on the horse waves his hat at you, you could continue forward. If he didn't wave his hat at you, you were to pull the car off the road to some location that was not visible to the horse on the road until the road the horse had passed completely out of sight and then you could continue on your way. All right, there are a lot of these rules that are coming into play for crypto. It's commonly said that cryptocurrency is unregulated, and I would insert that today it is the most regulated asset on the planet. It is, there are um, regulations and hearings and oversight by the SEC, by the Commodity Exchange Commission. There are, asked, there are, there are rules and regulations by the IRS. There are rules and regulations by various states, and those regulations are written to apply those rules to anyone who does transactions with one of their residents, uh, despite the fact that there is no digital identity, so I can't really know who's a resident and who isn't. In some sense, they've exported these regulations worldwide. There are other countries that have done the same thing, and as I, as, as I go look, if I decided I wanted to be fully compliant with all the regulations that might apply to me in a transaction. I'm not even sure I could list everything, every place I would have to look to ensure, to even find out what the regulations are against that transaction. There is not another commodity on the planet that has that many people coming to the table and telling you that there's this regulation or that regulation or you can't do this or this is what you have to do and this is how you have to report it, this is how you're gonna pay taxes. It is, it is the most regulated asset on the planet today. The saving grace is none of these regulators really have any decent way of knowing what you're doing, and so most of the regulations are just ignored. But this is a big problem because we never really know 
what these regulators are going to do in the future or what to what uh, extent they are going to go and research and try to, to nail you on some trivial paper crime where you didn't know anything about a regulation and so you didn't you didn't comply. And so um, so I I believe one of the big problems is to regulate acceptance of crypto, regulate where cryptography solves the problem, you don't need regulations to solve the problem. Uh, you know, where cryptography eliminates fraud, then you don't need regulations to as well. Uh, there's no army supporting Bitcoin and North Korea is following the rules. We need to look at our opportunities to trim regulation away because we know the cryptography has it handled. And the last topic we just want to mention is this is going to bring third world countries. This is going to even the board for everyone. Absolutely. All of Africa's transactions and all of the banking and financial systems in Africa funnel through two banks. And those two banks uh, are a, it have such wonderful toll booth opportunities that the cost of doing business is enormously high relative to uh, the rest of the world. And uh, there is a pyramid today. And the pyramid has at its base all of the people with very, very few assets. Most of the people in the world have very few assets. And as you go up the pyramid, you get to the people at the very top that, that really have massive resources. And the banking and financial system uh, scales in cost the same way. We charge those with the least the most, and those at the top the very, very least. In fact, banking is practically free for the, for the, for the ultra wealthy and, the, and those with massive resources. And it makes sense when you consider the fact that the economic footprint of the poor is very, very small. Therefore, it's very, very hard to know if they're trying to commit fraud. Someone with a lot of assets has a huge economic footprint, so you can sue them, you can extract wealth from them. Therefore, they, they pose little risk. Therefore, transactions are safe. And, you know, so it makes sense that they pay very little Mm. while everyone else pays a lot. But with Bitcoin, cryptography works the same for everyone. So a transaction from the poor is just as safe as a transaction for the very rich. And this is the leveling that the cryptocurrency has for the developing world. It, it, it throws away the pyramid and replaces it with a level playing field. Wonderful. Paul, this has been an amazing interview. Please tell everyone how they can follow your work. Well, I'm, I'm Paul Snow. I'm at factum.com and occasionally uh, chairing the Texas Bitcoin Conference. And um, that's probably the easiest places to find me. I really, really appreciated the opportunity to talk to you, Michelle. This has been just wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you. Mr. Paul Snow, founder and CEO of Factum. For the cryptocurrencies, the future of digital money show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.